Yeah. Welcome, everyone. We're going to get started. Grab a plate. Thanks, as always, to Murray and to Tova. Thank you, Murray, for an amazing lunch, as always. It's wonderful to see everybody. So as promised, uh, we're going to begin our class today with the go around. Uh, you can opt out of it. You can pass. But I want to hear from everyone now um, if they can share a midrash that we've covered in the class so far that is particularly spoken to them and why. Uh, we want to, you know, two minutes. It doesn't need to be long. And, and I have a session prepared for us once we're all done. Um, so we'll keep an, an eye on, on the time to make sure it doesn't go too long. But but I, I think it's important to hear from everyone and just do a little check-in. I'll start. Okay, good. So we'll start with Sheila and we'll go around. and Actually, the first we'll one the about uh, the Tanur. I forgot my shoes. Um, Avakna. Uh, it's just the stubbornness of some people that, you know, they're, they're not flexible. And it's so timely now. Yes. It's timely with in America with the politics, right? And timely with Israel. Yeah, you know, they're just not budging. Right. My opinion is right. Right. You know, that one just hit me. Good. Good. Okay. Thank you. Beautiful. David. So I I think that there are a lot of them that we study together, and some that we haven't yet studied together that I really like. But I also do like the oven of Achai for a different reason because I like the idea that. It's about, uh, you know, the Torah is here, not in heaven, and we get an opportunity to try to see what we what it means to us in every generation. So to me, that's one of the things I like about the conservative movement. I, I like that we're still grappling with this and we feel bound by it, but we need to understand what it is and actually think. And as... Uh, I'll give uh, Rabbi Latovsky credit for this. Uh, when I've studied with him, one of the things he said this, uh, that resonates with this particular one is this idea that if we've, God gave us brains, we better be thinking and not just uh, uh, not thinking. Let's put it that way. Good. So hold on to that because that's going to come back in our session today, the, the new Midrash. Uh, Bob, I see your hand. We're going to keep going in, in order, but then we'll we'll end with a Zoom. Unless you have a comment on what's been said so far. Okay, great. Right. Okay. I like the one about love because the you idea. Like oh, sorry, <laughs> the the idea that God makes love more than matches, and and that's how it always felt when after we met, it mm. was like the shared. So that's why. That's all. <laughs> that's so nice. Thank you. Lovely. Pass. Okay, I like a few actually. The what? She likes a few. a few. The one that I like, I think the best, was the one with the blind man. Because this way he shows that we all need to look about each other. Okay, so nice. that's, that's, that's the one they like the best. I'm always forgetting. And there is another one with the prison, you know, the rabbi yes. that help each other. Right. And makes me think of Tobima Shnai Minai Yeah. So. You will tell them one, yeah. Yeah. So, unfortunately, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, so there are a few things that I like. Beautiful. And a similar theme connecting them. Yeah. Good. Um. I think the one that I like best was uh, I think that's the one that Kalina said. Or maybe about Abba to the sea. Somehow it's told to me that really the community helps. Absolutely. I can't hear. She, she likes the also the um, visiting uh, somebody who's sick is like freeing the captive. So showing up for each other in community and the importance of of reaching out. Ruth does that. Ruth does that very well. You reach out. Yes, you do. No. Thank you. No, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for that. Welcome. Okay, good. This is good for you, then. You're getting an overture. Yeah. Good. <laughs> okay. Um, mine is actually the one we're going to do today. And we're doing the one we're doing today because I asked for it. Oh, okay. I'm going to ask if you shake it. Okay. 
He's going to segue into our lesson today. So I'm going to skip him for now. We'll come back. This is something I don't dealt with. Right. But a wealthy woman who talked with God about how how easy it is to make a match. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that resonated with me where um, it seems like an easy thing. But what happens to those poor people <laughs> after they beat each other up? Right. That he tells you that what may seem good on paper, there are things involved that have to do with the inner serve, the inner part of people. I love that. Mm -hmm. Beyond our ability, there's something spiritual and cosmic about it. I like the one on help, oh. where it was very important for people to listen with this and not always with the heart. And I always have problems at times where people will be very practical and logical and responding to me, but I would say, I don't need that. I need you to understand how I feel. So I help people and how people respond to you. Beautiful. Thank you. And mine is love. Um, living through these turbulent times right now, and you've got your nucleus family whom you love and your friends, but it's my non-Jewish friends right now who are reaching out, including uh, an actual sister, uh, one of a nun, who okay. said, we are all praying for you, Jews, because we love you. And that has stayed with me. And I said, keep on praying. Beautiful. That's great. Yeah, we come fast. You know the same video. Um, <laughs> Do you know the first one? But the ovens really spoke to me. You know I have you know studied it lots of times before. Never understood it. This is the only time I understood it. So thank you, Rabbi. I mentioned that to you. And the one that I, the one that I that spoke to me that is the um. The, the last one with the with the helping each other, prison. Yeah, I think that that is lovely. Thank you. I love in general the ones that had to do this relationships between people and people, relationships between us and God. So in general, that's a real buying game. Right. Okay, a relationship. Good. <laughs> but I think that's everyone in the physical room. How about on, on the Zoom space? Bob or Taibo? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I I picked the one I liked the least, <clears throat> which <laughs> nice. which which was the moon complaining, <laughs> and um, <laughs> it just didn't talk to me. So for something that I like, I like the idea that when somebody is traveling, you give them some money to take with them, that makes their trip um mission of Sadaka uh, so that nice. they would be protected on their trip. That's nice. Oh, nice. Good. Thank you. Taibo, you want to share? Sure. So um, nice. Uh, it's not just this fit nicely on my virtual background. Um, oh. But two things. If for people who don't know, Taibo is Yiddish for Dove. And there were there was more than one mention of Dove, but this one? was the um, this was oh, a I don't know that is. Yo, no, it's uh let's oh I can't make it bigger. Um the first line, the last word me Yona learned from a dove. Um, uh nice. So this was a piece of rabbinic literature that I had never seen before. And mm. even though I don't necessarily if I had to jump up and down about what I would like to learn from a dove or people to learn from me, if I'm the dove, wouldn't necessarily be forbidden relations, but I'm going to conceptualize <laughs> that yeah. to, to boundaries, that it's really important mm. to have boundaries. And anyway, so that's the one. Oh, I love it. Thank you. That's great. Okay, we're going to go to Ron now, who, who wanted to bring uh, a midrash we haven't covered. Helena, yeah? 
We didn't hear what you like. Oh, oh you caught me. I, all, of, well, all of these are his favorites. Yeah. That's why he's chosen them. <laughs> well, it is true. It is true. These are these are all of my favorites that I wanted to bring for all these different reasons that they're my favorite. It's hard now to choose one. It's like choosing a favorite child, um, which doesn't go well in, in our Torah. So yeah. <laughs> um, it's a great question. I honestly, I didn't think about it. Um, I'm not sure I have a favorite. I think I'll, I'll tell you that. Yeah, right. It actually, the, the one we did uh, last week from Tamar Biala about um, the ever turning sword, that one really speaks to me because I felt like in rabbinical school, I, of all places, my, my theology transformed in a number of ways, which I guess is good. That is the goal of rabbinical school. But, but I felt like, it cut me open in certain ways. And I know it's a violent image, but but it it really opened me up to it, it dissected what I what I believed and and allowed me to sort of out of out of out of that grow. Kind of like when you go to the gym and you break down muscle and it grows back stronger. I felt rabbinical school broke me down a little bit in certain ways theologically and then built me back up in a way that was productive and and really growth producing. So that's kind of how I take that midrash about God can be found in the places where you you have an opening up. Kind mm -hmm. of. Uh, Tybal, your hand. Um, so, you know, I'm the Alta Kaka who missed where to get the resource list until last week and all that other stuff. But I don't remember seeing any modern ones. I don't remember Tamar Baala on the the one. I mean, I know the Tamar Baala because I own a copy of Dershuni. So Good. But yeah. where was the yeah. Baala on the resource on the handout? That one was not on the handout because it was post assignment. It was <laughs> I, originally I was planning on doing the go around last week, and then the newest the new session was on Tamar Biala on modern midrash and uh, feminist midrash. Um, so it was not on there. But if you have uh, uh, if you have Dear Shuni. It would be the ever turning sword in English and Hebrew Acherva Mita Pechet, uh, which you can find. It's it's phenomenal, my fave. <laughs> okay, Ron, will okay. you give us an intro? So, how much do you want me to say now, or how much do you want me to say after we've read it? Ah, well, why don't you tell us why you picked it? And then after, during the session, you'll tell us why you voted. Oh, that's the same answer. <laughs> <laughs> I picked it because, um, well, I stumbled on it. I didn't know it before. I stumbled on this when I was looking for something else. And um, I think we could, oh, here comes my Orthodox background, which I don't have. Okay. But um, we learn out from it. <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> At least I did three different things. The first being that, that man and God are a partnership. And the second one is when we get to the umbilical cord, that you have to let go of your children. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, you have to let go of your children. As they grow, you have to let go more and more and more. And, and the third one was that, that man's purpose in life is to do mitzvot. That's what I to got out of it. That's right. Okay, that, that's your amuse bush. That's your appetizer. We're going to, I'm going to, uh, Introduce this and we'll read it further. But basically, so like Ron said, our session today is on divine partnership. So those who love Tanur of Achnai, for that reason, will get an extra dose today, but but through a different story, a different midrash here. Um, we are going to get a conversation between Turnus Rufus, who is a Roman officer. He's living 90 CE to 131 around there. He was a senator slash provincial governor of the Roman Empire. Um, he is known for many things. One of them was sort of a failed first phase of the Bar Kokhba revolt when the Jews revolted against Roman rule around that time, 131, 132, that uh, he originally failed to sort of squash it. Um, but ultimately, the Bar Kokhba revolt fails, as we, as we know. But um, so that's a little bit about. But what's interesting is Turnus Rufus and Rabbi Akiva, one of our great rabbis who lived in that time, we know that he was martyred. That's that's very relevant to the, the story of his relationship with Turnus Rufus. But they have a number of conversations, debates that are polemic in nature. 
Uh, this is the 85th uh, um, commemoration anniversary of, of Chris al -Nah. So I thought it was also very fitting to talk about anti-Semitism through the lens of a Turnus Rufus Rabbi Akiva debate. Turnus Rufus symbolizing Rome trying to squash the Jews. Um, but here he doesn't just want a physical victory, which obviously the Romans were able to do by physically sacking the temple and exiling and killing. And, but, but Turnus Rufus wants an intellectual victory over the Jews. He wants to best Rabbi Akiva in a debate. And there are a number of debates that they have. One is uh, about Sadaka. So, so uh, uh, Bob, you said you love the Sadaka Midrash that we didn't do, but here's one we're also not doing, unfortunately, but maybe in the future time. But Turnus Rufus says to Rabbi Akiva, um, why does God create poor people, basically? And Rabbi Akiva says, so that we, who are, in this case, are not poor, can do Sadaka, and and merit through through good behavior. Okay, so we can we can step that out. It feels a little bit selfish. Well, for my benefit, right? So that's a larger conversation about tzedakah we could have. But Turnus Rufus says, well, that doesn't make sense because if God makes poor people, which is his theological assumption, then it's like that's comparable to a king who locks away a prisoner, a slave, and then somebody comes in and and frees the slave or, or helps the slave, that's going directly against the king's orders. So your, your argument about tzedakah being this thing that God wants us to do is faulty, because why would God have made them poor if God wanted you to do tzedakah, right? It's it's violating God's will. That's his debate and his argument. And, and Rabbi Akiva responds by saying, that only works, your argument, if you see God as this king, queen, this, this ruler who's sort of dispassionate. There's a hierarchy, right? You're a slave. But he says, that's not the way I see God. I see God more as a parent figure, a father or mother figure. So I would think that it's your, if you want to give a comparison, it would be more like a father or who, who you know, punishes their child. Let's say it's a king and punishing his uh, son by putting him in prison. And then somebody comes along and sneaks him a sandwich or some money or helps him. The, 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 the parent w would actually want that. The parent would appreciate the act of compassion. The parent had to punish. There are timeouts, there are consequences, but a little compassion is actually what the, the parent wants all along. So that, that is a debate they have. But again, it's Turnus Rufus trying to uh, expose Judaism as being the inferior religion, uh, Rome being the superior uh, um, way of life philosophy. Yeah. Would you say that father and the son in that case is like Israel and the people of the, uh, in uh, Gaza and that we don't mind if we bring food, so if someone gives them food? You could go there. It's it's certainly not the in the mind of the author of that midrash, no, but it's an interesting drash, sure. About yeah, sure. You could go there. Um, okay, but so I want to dive in today. So who wants to read? We'll start in in the English. Any volunteers, go for it. Thanks, Jack. Turneth Rufus the wicked said to him, the Rabbi Akiva, the Rabbi Akiva, who by the way is imprisoned right now. Unrelated to our tzedakah conversation, about the Jews, but he, he has been uh, punished for teaching Torah, even though the Romans outlawed public teaching of Torah. So so you can imagine this conversation being like Turnus Rufus visiting Akiva in his jail cell and kind of having this. Interrogating. Yeah, and you, you get that in like a, <clears throat> a, a Socrates in the prison and, and being a, a, there's a Euthyphro, I think is the name. Anyway, that kind of thing. Philosophical debates happening between the martyr prison or like on death row and somebody who's trying to. Anyway, go ahead. Look at the heavens and the earth. Are you able to make anything like them? Rabbi Akiva said to him, do not talk to me about something which is high above mortals, things over which they have no control, but about things which are usual among people. He said to him, why do you circumcise? He said to him, and I also knew that you were going to say this to me, and therefore I anticipated your question when I said to you, 
A work of flesh and blood is more beautiful than one of the Holy One. Blessed be he. Bring me wheat, spikes, and white bread, he said to him. The former is the work of the Holy One. Blessed be he. And the latter is the work of flesh and blood. Is not the latter more beautiful? Tyrannus Rufus said to him, Inasmuch as he finds pleasure in circumcision, why do, does no one emerge from his mother's belly uncircumcised? Rabbi Akiva said to him, And why does the umbilical cord come out on him? Does not his mother cut his umbilical cord? So why does he not come out circumcised? Because the Holy One, blessed be he, only gave Israel the commandments in order to pur purify them. Therefore, David said in Samuel, the word of the Lord is pure. Good, and that's in Psalms as well. So, um, Turnus Rufus is trying to supplant <clears throat> Judaism by going to the covenant itself, right? This act of circumcision, which seems uh, <clears throat> bizarre to say the least, right? If Think about Roman philosophy and especially Greek as well. That you know, when you have the Olympics, you have the 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 um, pure, body. pure body, right? The beautiful form. The thing is yes, right. And it's perfect. Beauty. This is the beauty. This is the beauty, right? So you are desecrating the beauty of the and perfection of the human form, the, of the male form here, by circumcising. But but furthermore, if God, it's sort of like that Sadaka debate too. Like if God wanted us to be wanted males to be uncircumcised why not be born that way right why does why would we why would god want us to do such a seemingly bizarre ritual so he's he's trying to poke holes in judaism by 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 going to the the first covenantal act for a male um itself this this idea of the, it the became, breasts it became dangerous when the nazis came along mm -hmm. yeah right because it was one way to identify yeah. yeah. Um, Did any of the ancient people circumcise before? I mean, they do it in Africa. They have some, they do it on women. But, you know, uh, were the Jews the first? I can't imagine the Jews were the first one to practice it. That's a good question. And uh, anthropologically, I'm not sure. Does anybody else know? Were Jews the first to circumcise? I don't know. I mean, where'd they get the idea? Yeah. Most of the things that they do God, but yeah, are in reaction to right and to surrounding cultures. On. I mean, it's relatively clear that <laughs> at least art, if nothing else, uh, that in many parts of the ancient world it was not practiced. But that does not do anything to your to answer your question. So, uh, but it, it, <clears throat> where did Africa? I mean, Africa. Where did they get it from? They do all kinds of and well, you can buy in <laughs> Indians. The question is whether they got it from the uh, from Islam, but I don't know the answer to that either. It seems it seems no, a reasonable no, hypothesis. Indian cultures they used to cut parts of their body. I mean, this was yeah, very different though than what we were doing. Usually, like mourning or worship yeah. practices stuff. But uh, Nelson, I see your hand. Oh, you Welcome. Yeah, I once put uh, a related question to a rabbi who. I wondered if, if the message to Abraham was circumcise your sons, not your daughters. Oh, oh. wait, say more. Oh, oh, it's saying that it's it's in in response to female genital mutilation, saying that yeah. as Jews we don't do that. Just, just oh, okay, like we don't sacrifice our children. You know, animal sacrifice. Similarly, we don't circumcise our girls, only our boys, kind of thing. That's an interesting theory. It could be. I need to do the the research on that. I'm not sure, but but regardless, you can see the polemic nature and the anti-Semitic nature of this. Although today it's it's also a question that's very relevant. More and more people are questioning the practice of circumcision, um, saying that you're making a choice over your child's. But then you can combat that and say, well, we do that all the time for their own good. What about vaccines? What about you know? And and even here, Rabbi Kiva says the umbilical cord, which, but. That you could say, well, of course you cut that. I mean, that's obvious, but something that's a part of the body. 
they discovered it helps prevent what HIV or yeah, there are medical arguments you can make, but you know, so when Ron said, yeah, 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 no, there have been studies to say that it is, it helps to prevent the transmission of STDs. Um, but, but, but the jury is still out. You could, you could argue that, that it doesn't really have such a significant health impact, but certainly that is an argument that we've been making for a, a good long time that it has health uh, uh, benefits. But what's interesting, when Ron sent me this, it was in the context of another uh, rabbi or educator giving, his, I think, his little um, drash on it as well. And what, an interesting thing he oh, said yeah. is, when I circumcised my son, one of the reasons it was so powerful for me is that it's one of the uh, mitzvot that actually is hard to um, mm -hmm. rationalize. Mm -hmm. You could with the matter that's good for you, or like yeah. the same way with hash fruit. People say, "Oh, you don't need pig because they roll around in that." But at the end of the day, he was saying, yes, he was saying it's a chok, it's a law, it's an ordinance. And for him, what was so uh, meaningful is that I'm actually just doing something that may not even make sense to me, simply because I believe that God told me so. <laughs> you know, for a lot of people, they, that's not enough for them, but but. It's refreshing that sometimes, you know, maybe it is. Maybe maybe you just want to do something because you believe God told you or because as Jews, this is what we do. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. I just don't even understand the discussion. It's the sign of the covenant. Right. That's it? Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly right. Well, that's that's what he was saying. Right. God said to do it. It's a right. sign of the covenant. That's right. No, no discussion needed. Right. But Rabbi Akiva is uh, having to explain this to a non-Jew, and he doesn't just say, because God told me so, right? He is actually, he comes up with a rational argument, which is what? The unbiblical. Well, yes, there's that. But what's his larger point? What's Rabbi Akiva's main, the, main point the here? The wheat stalks with the bread. Yes. The, yeah, I mean, the idea not finished. Is, it's not finished. It's not exactly finished. what Ron was saying earlier, which is that God wants us to do our part of this. Right. That it is a partnership. That that we that at least in this case, Jewish males are are born incomplete, and God is wanting us to partner in the act of creation. Now you could ask, how come? Well, then why not with girls? And that's a very valid question. But for here at least, um that, the answer. <laughs> there you go. Right. Girls are born perfect. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah, right. Right, right, right. <laughs> Um, okay, so, so, but that, that is a very revolutionary, and especially in the context of a debate with the Romans here, because Turnus Rufus is a firm believer in hierarchy, right? There are stronger forces of nature, right? There's a, the Romans are better than the Jews. We can prove that and show that he, physically, obviously, he's also wanting to prove it intellectually, um, they have two fails ultimately, because this is our 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 work here this is our our literature so we're going to come out victorious but but also rabbi akiva is one of our greats so so he bests him in his own right but but um so what, why is it done with a moil as opposed to the, so you doing it yourself it's supposed to be done by the the father but given that that could be catastrophic we <laughs> we have a shaliyah just like with in in Gittin, it with a if you with a get you can you can commission a shaliach a messenger to deliver it though it's supposed to be the husband so there are cases in Jewish law where you can commission a shaliach to, to work to operate as your agent and do it's, the dirty work to do the dirty work yes in the okay. case of a marriage uh -huh. do you need you don't need a rabbi to perform it you can just say the words right yeah. A, a rabbi at a kedushin is just a mesader kedushin, an, an orderer of the holiness. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you, th you think about all the things that rabbis do. We don't really need them. <laughs> okay, you, you, you know, is it, where, where is there one place where you really have to have a rabbi? I need a mute button here. You're gonna. Actually... <laughs> okay, you don't need a rabbi to. You don't need the rabbi. Um... Run, but we do not like to do a lot of things by ourselves. We're chicken. <laughs> In other words, even taking care of ourselves, <laughs> taking care of ourselves, we want doctors. Right. We don't even want nurses. I mean, right now, who think now we don't want the nurse practitioner? We don't want the nurse. We don't want the nurse practitioner. We want the doctor himself. Yes, yeah. <laughs> 
there are some obviously incredibly well trained nurse practitioners and some that are able to get more. Yeah. Some people I hear you. struggle themselves to acquire the knowledge to do certain things mm -hmm. where other people do not. Right. It can be a specialty in it. Yeah. Exactly. And so the rabbi became the special the specialist because the Kohanim are not doing the job that they were intended to do. Right. Speaking for yourself, right? Yeah. <laughs> Talking about Jackie, I mean, why do people today we want these beautiful kid to book? Okay, right. Jackie makes kitubas, mm -hmm. and um, oh, what, I mean, mine is a out. mine goes mine is filed under kitchen of equipment. Right. I'm not well, joking. Yeah, actually, I mean, it's a simple that's law. You can't have the kind you know of four page thing, whatever. Right. I and think what we're also dancing around. See once because again, we want something. Yes, but what we're also the dancing around well, is the. the main meaning of the word anyway, which is teacher, right? We need somebody who, uh, this Jackie implied this, but I'll just make it explicit. We need somebody who studied it more to help us learn it. Right. Okay, good. So you've you've kept me in, in business. I appreciate it. Hi, Paul. Because I realize chat doesn't work. I don't know everybody. And even if I do, I can't see everybody. But is Helena the yeah. only physician in the room? No, no. <laughs> well, but I know one position. So maybe with permission, Sheila will allow me to amend her statement about doctors himself, nurse, whatever, and say doctors herself or himself. See the doctor. Ah, yes, true, true, true. Yeah, of course. Yes. Thank he you. or she, not just he. Yeah. It's okay. We don't need to mute it. Yeah, it's okay. but good. Thank you. So, okay, let's now he makes us reference here that we're actually going to expand on in another midrash so this is going to our next midrash is sort of giving context so like what what does rabbi akiva mean like obviously he de demonstrates right bring the wheat versus the bread that that god gives us wheat and and that is a miracle right the fact that we have wheat there there's it's miraculous however it's not supposed to be where we're supposed to end you can't just eat wheat raw right god is giving us the raw materials to then build upon it's not just, but but so it's interesting because, but Rabbi Akiva is saying the the the, the basic question here is that Turnus Rufus is trying to paint uh, uh, Rabbi Akiva into a corner. In is uh, I'm going to get you to say that uh, that that people can create something better than God, which is heresy, right? How could you say that? It's obvious, God, and this is going back to the Roman philosophy of the hierarchy, right? Like. The, the gods and nature the, that is that is the realm of perfection and 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 how could you say that that people can can produce something better than God and Rabbi Akiva is able to turn it and say no actually people human made things are better because that is the combination of God's raw materials with with a unique process that only we can partner with it, it elevates us. <laughs> And, but what's so interesting there is that it, instead of being put in our place, it elevates us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. It's mm -hmm. it's saying that we actually have a unique role as human beings. And and the question is, at the end of the day, and this is why we're bringing it eighty five years after Kristallnacht, is that the the Roman Empire falls, but the Jews remain. This uh, this this notion that Turnus Rufus symbolizes of like a natural hierarchy. <laughs> is supplanted by Rabbi Akiva's notion that, no, it's not about your natural order in the universe. It is about the human pursuit of, of perfecting yourself, right? The, the act of circumcising yourself. You, you are constantly, it's not just how you're born, perfect or not perfect or in a hierarchy. It is the act of partnering with God to try to better yourself, to, to, to better your position, to, to, um, Crystal Mac was 39, right? Mm -hmm. Today. 38. 38. 38. 38. 38. 38. That's too bad. 1938. 38. Wow, you're under 38. Yeah. The Berlin Wall came down in the same date in 89. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, so good. So maybe that, that also is revealing part of Judaism's secret sauce. This, this idea that... Shows that we have the capacity... To, to assist God. Right. Right. I don't uh, want to get us off track, but if uh, if this is a midrash on Tazria 5, yes. Uh, 
what what actually is I I didn't I didn't open the uh, parsha to look at it. What is that actually saying there? It is it is probably the actual law of circumcision, yeah. which is in Leviticus. I think it's Wherever in Tazria. Yeah. It's in Tazria. I would, yeah. I'm pretty sure. I'll need okay. to confirm that, but I think it's going off of the actual law that you mm -hmm. circumcise your male children on the eighth day. Okay, but now I, I want to get into the context here about the the wheat and the bread. So we're we're going to go now to Tana de Bay El This yeah. is our next source, um, believed to be finished with its redaction in the 10th century. Um, who would like to read in the English? One time I was walking on the way, a man found me and went with me on the way of mitzvot. And he had mikra, written law, but no mishnah, that is oral law. Okay, meaning that he was he understood Torah, he was good at Torah, but he didn't have the the oral law, so Mishnah Talmud. He wasn't learning mm -hmm. Mishnah or Talmud. And he said to me, Rabbi, Mikra was given to us from Mount Sinai. Mishnah was not given to us from Mount Sinai. And I said to him, my son, Mikra and Mishnah were both of them said from the mouth of God. And what is the difference between Mikra and Mishnah? Rather, he told he told him a parable. Cool. So before we get into the parable, this idea, which I don't know if anybody else relates to, but I have. Uh, uh, throughout my Jewish journey, which is why why is Talmud it, 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 Talmud is is real? I've had rabbis who say that you know, Talmud is really the core of Judaism, and I always feel like I am insulted when because what do you mean no Torah? It's it's got to be Torah. It's got to be. But this is sort of like again the same discussion from earlier. What is better, it's the, the God made thing? Or the human-made thing. The same partnership it's thing. Partnership. Right. So you're going to see God how... God gave us mm -hmm. the, the, Torah Torah, and the written the Torah. Torah. Right. Yeah. Man came up with the oral Torah. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's where we're going with this with this debate. So let's go. Let's get the parable. The mashal. Okay. Rather, he told him a parable. To what is this matter similar to a human king, literally a king of flesh and blood, who had two servants, and he loved them with a great love. And he gave to one a cob, a measure of wheat, and to the other, uh, to the, and to the other cob of wheat. Yeah, so they each get the same okay, measurement of wheat. Okay, so they get a wheat. And he also gave to each one of them a bundle of flax. The wise one of them took the flax and wove a beautiful cloth, and took the wheat and made it into fine flour, and sifted it, and ground it, and kneaded it, and baked it, and set it on the table, and spread the beautiful beautiful cloth over it, and left it there until the king should come. And the fool of them did nothing. After some time, the king came into his house and said to them, to his two servants, my sons, bring me what I gave you. One of them brought out the bread of fine flour on the table with a beautiful cloth spread over it. And the other of them brought out the wheat and a pile and a bundle of flax upon it. Woe for that shame. Woe for that disgrace. Which one is more favored? You must admit it is the one who brought out the bread on the table with the beautiful cloth spread over it. And I further said, rather, when the Holy One, blessed be God, gave the Torah to Israel, it was only given to them as wheat from which to bring forth fine, fine flour and as flax from which to weave a garment. That's beautiful. It's good, right? So it's something that is... Uh... I feel bad for the first one. I feel bad because mm -hmm. he's really rebuked, called a fool. Shame, shame that you would not. To, but but on the other hand, I mean, it's a safekeeping. It was the letter of the law yes. that he followed. Literal, right. But, you know, right. He didn't ca allow it to carry to a higher level. Right. I don't understand the impulse. Basically, the, the, the question here is, what is our role as human beings in relation to the divine? Number one is the container. Right, God has given me the flax and the wheat. These are sacred. I will put these on a pedestal and keep them safe. And 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 it is my sacred duty to protect what God has given me. I don't think that's a fool. I, I think that's that's a devoted, wonderful response. Simplistic about. Simply what? Simplistic, simplistic. but it's simplistic. Yeah. And the other one, it's go ahead. He's hungry than clothes. Yes. It doesn't make sense either. Right. Which reminds me of the old discussion about the argument with the Karaites, if you will. You, God doesn't want you sitting in the cold on Shabbat with nothing to eat. <clears throat> right. Right. Good. Absolutely. Right. Wait, somebody was saying. Was it, which, 
Okay, I thought I heard a voice over here. Um, and I see the two hands on on Zoom. I just want to finish this one thought, and I'm gonna I'm gonna call on you, which is that. Um, so that's the one approach is putting it on a pedestal to show that you love something, but the other is to to hold it close and really tinker with it and and sort of that that goes back to the dissecting image that was so meaningful to me that that sometimes loving something is really sort of getting your hands dirty with it and 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 really trying to understand it and tinker with it and, mm -hmm. and sort of spin new mm -hmm. creations with it not separate and apart from and at the expense of but as a sort of evolution mm -hmm. through human partnership with the divine raw materials uh let's go uh Nelson Bob and then Sheila and me too okay and then Ron yeah <laughs> I my understanding is that this this difference between uh, literally depending so strictly on the written Torah and and including the oral Torah is that one of the differences the main difference between Judaism and the Samaritans. Mm -hmm. And so my question in part is why doesn't the, this particular uh, midrash mention that? And I'm wondering if they were afraid because they think that the Christians. Um, value Samaritans, because there's the story of the good Samaritan, uh, whatever that's about. Um, and they're afraid that this will, they don't want to make this into an insult of Christianity. Yeah, there are some things in Talmud that are edited out or, or polished up to avoid the censorship, right? The, the being censured or the censorship of, right? So sometimes like a, a nohri as opposed to um, what is it? Somebody may know here, but, but basically, um, you know, like referring to Christians or, or Jesus, or there are, it, it gets euphemized, like use euphemism to tone down what's otherwise a pretty you mean harsh Edom? word. Edom? Uh, the Romans? Right. That's a little bit different. That's more of okay. tracing lineages biblically, you know, rabbinically, but, um, so it could it could be that there's a reference here to Samaritans that they're covering up, but but I'm not sure. I I, I looked at the context earlier, and they they certainly don't go there. Though it's interesting to see that in there, and I can see why you do. That's a good point, uh, Bob. Yeah, uh, I want to speak in defense of the uh, the guy who kept his wheat. Sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> The wheat is the seed of the plant. Mm -hmm. So for the next season's growing of wheat, mm -hmm. you need seeds. seeds for the future. Mm -hmm. Good. So, so good. The, the bread and the tablecloth is good for a day, tablecloth longer. But, yeah. but if you're actually going for longevity, you need to keep it as it is. Yes. That's interesting. Oh, oh, sorry, Sheila and then Marvin, yeah. Oh, the and then Ron, sorry, the, Sheila, Ron, Marvin, yep. The one who's doing, who made the bread and the cloth is occupying himself. The other one could do all kinds of bad things like war. The other one has something to oh. do. <laughs> the other one can yeah. get into mischief. Right, right. The devil he loves idle hands. He doesn't have it. He's not yeah. doing anything. Okay, good. So so, so that's one thing, right? If we're... If we're La sok bedivrei Torah. But isn't that interesting? That's our prayer for studying Torah. La sok bedivrei Torah to busy ourselves with words of Torah. It's not just to sort of blindly recite it. As Jews, we're supposed to la sok bed. We're supposed to really immerse in and get get our hands dirty with and occupy us. It gives us activity, but it also is more active, less passive. Are we passive recipients of Torah, or are we active partners in unfolding revelation? The Gentile, I mean, when you go into a church, I mean, they do not study. I'm, th I'm not talking about the priests themselves. Some of them may be delving in more into the Bible and whatever, but they don't do what we do with this. It's pulling <laughs> apart. So that, that's the Talmud, right? That's the Mishnah and the it's Talmud. Not just, and... It's Rashi and whatnot. Right. I mean, we get through with it. You wonder what it said originally. What funny, funny. Said. We and... slice and dice. We slice and dice, right? That's They're right. going back to the ever-turning sword. Uh, right? you know, midrash too, and that's also why I wanted to bring this in the context of a midrash class. Is it's sort of the the um, raison d'etre, the uh, proof of concept of what we're doing here, right? When we do this kind of thing, it is it is weaving the 
flax into into cloth and kneading the. And that's the why we're so smart because we no seriously. Yeah. No, it's it is more active and more intellectual. I think a, you, you study Talmud, and some it used to be that you could skip a number of courses in law school. Right, because there's because a you, you knew assumed the, the understanding of it. The way to think legally. And yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Mark. If you look at the written law as the seed, then you have to do more with it or, or it doesn't serve its purpose. Right. Say, say explain more, say more. Well, if if you, I mean, there's the seed in the... In, in the oh, there's still there's still a partner. The written law is the seed good. itself. Yeah. Yeah. And you have still to have do to more plant with it, it or... Good, good. So that's interesting, Bob. That's a good way to sort of synthesize, right? That even, you have to plant it. Even the seeds, you still have to plant it. That's there's still a human activity. Then you better be doing the commandments, or you don't get rain. Right. Good. Yes. Okay. The Shema, right? If, and then if you don't, if you're not behaving well, you don't get yeah, the rain. Yeah, so it, like there is a human element even in even in the first scenario. Um, right. So let's skip me again. Oh God. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's okay. Go for uh, it. I, I think I'm off the wall here, but I'm looking at this. I mean, he made the bread. And then he beautified it by adding the cloth. Mm -hmm. the, can I learn from that that you're supposed to beautif beautify the commandments? Hidor mitzvah. Yeah, so Hidor mitzvah yeah. is Rabbi Alex's favorite concept, or one of them. And this is somewhere where we deferred in our, this is like sort of the rabbinical school ra to we rabbi to conflicts. Her, we have to her, her class. To about yes, that. yes. Okay. Well, it's poetry, right? But that, <laughs> that is something that we used to argue about because we even fight like rabbis, which is, you know, <laughs> I'm like, okay, you know, got a, when Shabbat rolls around, like I'm, I'm working all day. I like to have like a pencils down moment into Shabbat where it's like, okay, you know, you work all day and then whew, you finally just like let Shabbat take in and that's great. And she goes, no, <laughs> she says, Shabbat is all about that Friday starting at like noon. You got to start playing music. That's why you have to start. You have to, yeah. <laughs> got to make some, you have to have a tea and cake moment. Yeah. It's a mood that you build up to and you have to beautify there. I'm like, you know, I don't say, I, I don't care about what the table looks like. I don't care about the, I'm just like, okay, no, you know, we did it. We have that. We have a uh, dinner. We married to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, it's like Kava Kavana too. It's like, is it, it's just important that we do it. Whereas she says, you know, it's important how it's in, right. When you really love something. It's the same thing at the other end where you, where you lengthen it by, Waiting to do Havdalah. Right, right. You don't just pick up the pen again. That's true. Yeah, exactly. No, exactly. And, also, and, and smear it out, right? You, uh, rabbis talk about this. I remember going to something at Eshat Torah, and um, they were telling us how you start preparing for Shabbos on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 but one thing, just in this conversation about Shabbat, what, does, what did the second person essentially make nothing shabbos right oh, oh. tablecloth and hala yeah right yeah so okay go ahead helena so you not only eat you say you prepare the dinner and that's it you first of all see Sing. with your eyes oh, this see. way you also the smell of the hala right. baked in the house when my husband used to come from work Oh my God! It smells so good in the house. So it's the, you put all the senses in, right. essentially. Exactly. So you are much more. So I agree with your wife. I, you know what? <laughs> It's the same thing for exactly you know, you're married to. But, but, but it didn't come naturally to me because for me, I thought, and I see tables and I went to the table. But I, for me, it's like it's the mitzvot, it's the halakha. It's important that the sukkah just needs to be this dimension by that dimension. She's like, no, we got to go to Michael's. We got to get all this stuff. <laughs> and and that's actually what the mitzvah is about. It's not just that you've done it and you've fulfilled the obligation. It's that this is something that's joyful and beautiful. And, and that's life. Is it just, is it, do you look at things as things you just have to get through for the sake of doing it? Or is it something to, to beautify and to make beautiful? That's the original idea. An artist. The but, original but let's go to Tybal then run. Tybal then run. Sorry, because it's here. Well, my original question um, is, is, Ron, we're going is that through. here or did I make that up? Ah, okay. Um, no, I, I, is it here? Look, I, any good art, you can't say it, it's, yes, that's there. No, it's not there. I think if you see it in there, it's in Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Tybal. Um, two things. The first is about the point about making Shabbos. I want to amplify something Sheila just said. You know, um, Sheila's uh, 
I can't think of the right word, but am, whatever today. Um, but that's what the tradition is that we're always looking to Shabbos that you you say Shavuot Tov from after sundown, after Shabbos to the last time you can make Havdalah because you're looking back at the last sweetness of the last Shabbos. But then once the three stars on Tuesday, the last time you can make Havdalah, you're supposed to start wishing people good Shabbos in advance. And even <laughs> traditional yeah. dating on letters for centuries had to do with which Parsha, whether it, like mm. at the top of the letter would be yep. the previous Parsha up to Tuesday. Anyway, that's one. But the other is since you're getting personal, inquiring mind here wants to know, she doesn't require that you dance. You listen to music, but you're not supposed to dance as part of the preparation too? <laughs> it's supposed to beautify. If I were to dance, it would not beautify any. <laughs> Great response. <laughs> okay, so I want to get to our final our final text today, which is not a midrash; it's commentary from a Barbanel or a Bravanel, but fifteenth uh, century Portugal, uh, Italy, and then Italy. Um, but so he comments on uh, there are. We know that when when Moses goes to get the tablets, there are two episodes. Right? We get the first. There there are two sets of tablets. The first, which Moses smashes when uh, 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 the Egel is Ahab, right? When they worship the golden calf. And then there's the second tablets. And it's, God says, and what was written on the second was exactly on the first. So you might think they were identical tablets, but they're not. Does anyone know why, how the tablets were different? First set from second set? Yeah, Moses had one. to carve the second set. Mm -hmm. Exactly, it was a partnership. In God, yes. In God, would did the first ones. Right, exactly. The first tablets were were carved. The stone themselves were were carved, and 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 then God inscribed the tablets. So both were God. The second one, God says to Moses, "Hew hew tablets like the first," and then God inscribes it. So it's it's carved by human beings, written by God. So let's let's read a Barbanel's commentary. Anybody want to? Want to read? Go for it, Cheryl. Why did the second set of tablets have greater holiness than the first set, as indicated by the verse, and no man shall ascend the mountain with you? <clears throat> and for the first tablets, the verse said, ascend to God, you and Aharon and Nadab and Avihu. Also here the verse warned, the sheep and the cattle shall not graze adjacent to the mountain. While no such restriction appears with the, for respect to the first tablets, it appears that the second tablets that Moses carved were holier than the first set that were carved by God. Isn't that so interesting? So, so what Abravanel is saying here is the first set was a little, there were fewer restrictions, fewer boundaries, mm. because it says that... Uh, uh, God says to Moses, ascend you and Aaron and Nadav and Avihu, Aaron's sons. Which only, they only were allowed to go a certain, certain distance. They still didn't go all the way. True. That's true. They didn't go all the way up, but they were allowed further up. And Abravanel is saying, okay, well, that's an indication that this is more accessible. And if it's more accessible, it's less holy because more people are allowed up, right? There would be greater boundaries if it was holier. Right. But they're allowed up. And then also uh, it says that uh, the sheep and the cattle shall not graze adjacent to the mountain for the for the for the second set, which Moses carved. The first set, it doesn't say that the, the sheep and the cattle can't graze again, meaning more access to animals, which makes it less holy in the sense that if the animals are allowed to graze there, something less holy is happening. But something more holy must be happening in the second time. If it, this time it says only Moses comes up and further the sheep and the cattle cannot graze by the mountain. So something more holy is happening here. What is more holy about the second set? Abravanel says it's because the second was a partnership. The first one was was a passive receiving. Why go ahead, the animals? Oh, sorry. I was, um, <laughs> yes, uh, good. That's a good point. Well, I, I, I misread what he said. I thought that I thought the sheep and the cattle were on the first one. But so my comment might not make any sense this way. Uh, I'm thinking that the second set, it just didn't explicitly say it, but it was supposed to be the same rules. Could, could be, could be. But, and, and that's why it's interpretation, right? right. But, but he is saying that it's significant. 
that it was only that sheep the animals were allowed to graze with the first one because something less holy was happening. And I agree with Jackie's uh, uh, objection to that, that animals are a source of holiness and, and say, you know, being a creature of God. And so I shouldn't be disparaged in that way. But I think the point here being that you're supposed to feed animals first before you're good. Good. Before you, you eat yes. But I think that I, there's to. still something inherently a little bit dirty or given like, oh, they're going to go to the bathroom. They're going to, right? You, <laughs> you want to make something more holy by could, saying don't, don't have access. You could view it a little bit differently. And maybe this reconciles uh, with Jackie's point, which is that earlier when we're all told don't get too close to the mountain, it seems the concern is lest you die. Right. So we don't want to kill our animals <laughs> by inadvertently putting them in a place where they're certain to die. Good, sure. Good. Helena. I wanted to look also at this thing from another aspect. Okay. So the first ones, God did everything. And Moses was very readily smashing them. Mm -hmm. When you do something, oh. By yourself, you think twice before you smash it. Yeah. Because you know how much work went into it. Uh, oh. Interesting. So maybe it engenders a greater, deeper appreciation and love of Torah, feeling that we have a stake in it. We, we have a, a sense of ownership. Maybe God wants us to feel we have a sense of ownership. And maybe that goes back to why circumcision is, is valuable. There's something about, you know, we don't tattoo, but we... We have a certain hand in our and in, 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 in peers, right? In creation, there's there's a partnership and a cre creating a sense of ownership in a way. Being Jews who talk about everything, I read a discussion about when we say tablets, what was the material upon which the Ten Commandments were written? Were they average stone? Were they special God-made things? And were the tablets made of the same material, the second set as the first set? And was that part of the issue? The, the first set was it. limestone because they could break. And the second set was granite because you couldn't break. Not as easily. I assume it's I assume it's the same, but I'm I'm not certain. But I assume it's it's regular material. It's metaphor. Yeah. Well, this starts with the assumption or with the statement that the second set were holy. Right. How do we know that? Well, that's his conclusion that because the second set was a partnership between Moses and God, that Moses carved them and God inscribed them. He is saying, and his support for that claim is look at the rules for the second one. They're more stringent, but more restrictive. And that implies that something holier was happening. And Abarbanel connects the dots saying, well, what was different between the two sets? Why would the second one be holier? Ah, it's because Moses car it, car carved it. There was a partnership there. That's what's holier. How does that translate so, into so, uh, reality? Circular. It's holier, so how does that change anything? Good. So that's where we end, right? So that that is, that is <laughs> the enduring understanding that I hope we land on, which is, what? So what? So what? If if part, divine partnership is holier than passive uh, receiving, I think it's empowering, and I think. 85 years after Kristallnacht and, and when the world tries to put us down, when the world says there's a hierarchy and you are lower on it, to, to remember that as, as Jews, we believe that we have a, a partnership with God in forging and carving a, a, a better future, a redemption. And, and, and that, that hinges on our engagement with this tradition. It's not something to be passively received. It's something to be, and that that elevates our role in the world as partners with God. And if you see yourself, and if you see others as partners with God and creation, how does that change your worldview and your and your your view of the other and of yourself? Quite frankly, yes, David. One thing it does is it inserts the element of inspiration. So that the work that has to go into this, because it's a lot of work and it never ends, isn't drudgery. It's mm -hmm. it's exciting. It's holy. It's worthwhile. It's elevating. And that's going back to Hidur Mitzvah a little bit, right? This is this is a beautiful um, opportunity that that we have to to partner with God in understanding what God wants from us, right? And 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 to play an active role and to to toil in it. 
but but not toil, right? Yes. It's part and parcel, isn't it, of Jews being the chosen people? This is what we're chosen to do. Right. Yeah. And and chosen is right. The big critique of chosen is this: it it, it may engender a sense of elitism. I know. Well, you better yeah, than it's me. A sense of obligation, actually. Right, but it, obligation, right? And for me, I've always thought as well. Everybody can, you know, it, it's not that we're better than necessarily. I don't go that far because I, I, I recognize that it could, but, but that we're all chosen for certain things. And this is, this is what we're chosen for. And that's, that's a sacred obligation. Yeah. It doesn't mean that other people aren't chosen for important and special things, but this just happens to be our tradition. This happens to be, to be our role as we perceive it. Going back to Shabbos, score one for Rabbi Alex. <laughs> <laughs> score one for uh, Rabbi Alex. Huh? Good way to go to place to end. But, but so I, I want to, um, I want to wish everyone a uh, Shavuot, a uh, Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, that's and, and, and that's part of the tools I hope we gain in this class or an appreciation is Midrash. And we're seeing how the rabbis did it, how the rabbis um, make challah and tablecloth from God's raw materials, from, from scripture, from, from Torah, right? What you can weave, the beauty you can weave from the raw materials and how they give us um, how they nurture these great ideas of how to live more meaningfully. But it comes from, and that's why I want, like, what's yours? What's your midrash going to be? What, what, what is, what's the, the life that you're going to weave out of the raw materials? But what, was, what was the logic of the people like the Karaites who didn't accept the idea that there was something beyond the story? They must have had arguments that they gave. Yeah, and it, it, I think it's the, the arguments that we've made for that first person who kept the, the the weed as it was, saying, who are we to tamper with God's perfect mm -hmm. gift, mm -hmm. right? Which chutzpah, but that's precisely the point, right? It's good chutzpah, we would argue, that says well, we should we should feel empowered. God wants us to. God yeah. is actually waiting for us to partner, but 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 you can understand the voice that says, Look, it's it says, and this is the literal. It's why what you brought up with the Constitution, right? The the in, initial intent versus evolving document. It's a it's a real debate. It's, there's no, it's not an easy answer. But you know, where, so where do you where do you come down on? It? Um, okay, last comment, and then I, I want to honor time. The written is the tool, and the Talmud is how we use the tool. Correct. Absolutely. All right. All right. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Great to see you. Thank you for joining. Cool. Cool. Thank you.